My name is John McDonald. I'm a Member of Parliament. Um, some time ago, I think it's about over a year ago now, we launched the People's Parliament, which is basically opening up the, this building to enable people to come along and talk about different topics, different issues, bringing together panels of experts, activists, etc., just to share ideas and often as a result of the sharing of ideas, maybe to take some actions as well. Um, this People's Parliament discussion is on land ownership, who owns our country. Our first speaker, just to set the scene, is Kevin Cahill. Kevin, people will know Kevin, he's the author of the, let me read the text blurb here, Kevin, can I? He's the author of the groundbreaking book on land ownership, who owns Britain and also who owns the world. Parliamentary researcher and associate editor of the Sunday Times Rich List, investigative reporter with the Sunday Times Insight team on offshore tax dodges, is publisher of the second Doomsday book of the United Kingdom. He's also a supercomputer specialist for Computer Weekly and wrote Trade Wards, an account of CIA spying in the UK and in the 1980s. So quite an eclectic range of interests there. <laughs> Start with a question. How many people here live in a freehold or own a freehold and think it's ownership? You should read the legislation. You are um, the holder of a piece of paper that was invented in medieval times, and that's the government statement. Freehold isn't ownership. It's a sort of peculiar lease. And that's the first. Now, the second question would be, how many people here actually know who owns the ground we stand on in this country? It's the ground. Yeah. Okay. For those who haven't, the, the owner of the physical land, there's one ultimate, the word in the legislation is ultimate. There's one ultimate owner of all the physical land, and that's the queen in the country. So your freehold lease is in some peculiar way a lease from the crown. Yeah, I know a lot of people don't know that one. Now, the... the Third, I'll tell you a tiny story. When I was a child, I lived in a small Tipperary village, and people find it very hard to visualize land. And one day, this sort of farmer came into the pub. Children could go in pubs in those days. And said to my father, you know, well, I've just, just come in, Mick, and I've been on the bike all day, and I still haven't come to the end of my land. And my father said, yeah, we got a bike like that too. <laughs> 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 um, but the thing is, people find it very hard to visualise land. I mean, how, how many people here know how big the United Kingdom is? The United Kingdom is about 60 million acres. And an acre is very, very roughly, depending on how you're measuring it, roughly the size of a football pitch. So our country is about 60 million football pitches. But now I'm going to move to, I feel if you want to talk about land, you should have some basic facts. And uh, Fiona's done a beautiful little map here. If everybody could, you do need this, it would be quite important. Because in terms of land use, I'll start with use before I come to ownership. In terms of land use, this country can be divided really simply into three. The first bit is urban you know, houses, bricks and mortar, and that includes factories and offices. And that is less than 10% of the island is covered in bricks and mortar. And I happen to think it's well less than 10%. But the accurate figures are not available from the government agencies who are paid millions to produce accurate figures, and they don't, none of them. You cannot get figures that reconcile as to how much you should be able to call the Environment Agency and they should be able to tell you two million acres are covered by houses, three million are covered by factories, a million are covered by roads. They will give you none of those figures. And they're paid millions to produce them and they don't. Anyway, the urban one is the big surprise because that means that 90% of the country is something else. And about 20%, the figures are approximations, I'm sorry about that, but. About 20% of the country is um, mountains, bogs, moors, roads. But 70% plus is agriculture. 70% of the United Kingdom is fields with cows and things in them. 
So there are the three key bits. Now, the next thing is, who owns the bits? Well, the largest number of people own or have freeholds in the smallest bit. There are, rather than talk about the number of people, the easy way to see it is how many houses are there? There's about 26 million, and about 17 to 18 million are private. And the other, the other, the 35% is split roughly into council housing, private rented, and um, housing associations. The big numbers are actually fairly simple. And they're not that, they're complicated to get because the government will not provide them. But anyway, so the, uh, go to the big bit, the green bit on the map. There are about, there's a little bit under 300,000 farms on that patch. And it's about 30 million acres. Now the number of people who own that is less than 150,000 out of our population of 62 million. So the big concentration of acres and ownership is in the agricultural sector. The big concentration of large numbers of people and very small ownership is in the urban area. So that's how it splits out. Um, one of the things I wanted to suggest is people tend to believe what they're told rather than what they see. Um, we, the, the, the most overpopulated part of the United Kingdom is supposed to be around here. No, outside the city, but not, but you know, Surrey. You know, everybody's living on top of each other. Well, if you catch a train from Gatwick to Heathrow, you will hardly see a town. You pass, the train passes predominantly through fields with cows in them, you know, little woods, commons, and all sorts of things. We have been sold the idea that we're, you know, crowded and there's no room and so on. And curiously, the people who sell us that idea are the people who own the green patch. <laughs> now, isn't that very odd that they should tell us, you know, there's no land and um, one of the organizations that promotes this idea is the Council for the Protection of Rural England. This is known as the hijack of a very good idea by crooks. The Council for the Protection of Rural England about four years ago produced an article and they said if we went on developing uh, housing at the rate we were doing it, the whole of England would be covered by concrete, by uh, 2035. They were only wrong by 2,300 years. <laughs> <laughs> the, f the figure for the development of housing was about 14,000 acres a year. And all they had, but the media, and here's, I'm criticizing my colleagues, the media just repeated. They never checked the figure against the size of England. And you would find, as I say, the Council for Protection of Rural England were 2,300 years wide. And of course, uh, you know, concreting is not going to happen like that anyway. We're tending to go up. But in the United Kingdom, one of the consequences of this is that homes in the United Kingdom are the smallest in Europe. Most of us are living in what virtually amounts to shoeboxes, and we don't need to. Um, what everybody in the UK, somebody did a survey, and you do, why do they waste money? What everybody wants is a sea view, a patch of garden, and a detached house. Ouch. Now, that would really put pressure on. Uh, that would take 28 million acres of the 30 million. But that's what, what people would like. But what you would like isn't what you can have, necessarily. You know, there are constraints. But the key thing is the people who are telling us that we're living on a crowded island are the people who own the, the bit, in which the crowding is about one person per 40 acres. Once you look at how many people there are in the green bit, zip, you're down to one, per, one person for 10 acres. If you switch to the urban area, you've got uh, 10 
homes per acre. So it's about 20 people per acre. The, the figure changed around. Now, if you didn't, so there's the map, and I hope we'll stick, we'll use that right through. Now, I want to talk about one other thing. How many people here know about the Doomsday Book? Could I? Okay, some people will know this is slightly, there were two. There wasn't one, there were two. The first one is the one you probably know about. And the publishers who reprint it periodically tell you it's a unique book and it's this, that, and the other thing. Well, the first book like it was found in 2030 BC in Memphis, and it once wasn't Memphis, Tennessee either. The first doomsday, the, the one of 1086, is very similar to, sim to other documents like it that all the despots of the ancient world uh, used. They all had lists of their properties, what they could tax and all that sort of thing. So doomsday one, and it's not a kind of primitive land registry. The references to who owned land are tangential because who owned land was the king, uh, William the Conqueror, and the people who held land, he was the sole owner. This is where this comes from, where the, 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 his tenants, there was no ordinary people, there were no ordinary people involved. But the key thing is, and, and this is the question I'd like you to ask yourselves, most people here will have done the history of the country. Try and figure how a real doomsday was left out of the history. It's missing, it's not there. You won't find it in any curriculum or any references in history books to it. And it was exactly what the first one is supposed to be and isn't. The second doomsday, and um, I'll show you what it looks like. This is one of the counties from the second doomsday. And if anyone wants to come up afterwards and have a look. It really was what the first one was supposed to be. <coughs> Everybody who owned more than an acre is in it and it was about 97% accurate. Now, the land registry until quite recently was um, about, uh, was 60% semi-accurate. And between 40 and 50% of England and Wales wasn't registered at all. The land registry have come up with figures saying that's changed, now it's 90% they have failed to explain how in 10 years they achieved what the previous 65 years failed to achieve. And the landowners down in Devon, the only place I can speak for, say most of them haven't registered. So where are all these <coughs> numbers coming from? They haven't registered. So we have a problem. We have a problem of a lie, how crowded our island is. We have a problem about history somebody managed to leave probably the most important book in British history out of the system. And the, the third thing is we have a very peculiar land registry. Anyway, can I leave you with those thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> okay, our second speaker is Fiona O'Clary. Fiona is a freelance reporter, shortlisted for the Press Gazette New Journalist of the Year 2013 award. The report on the conflict in Western Sahara is written for The Guardian, The Mail, and other, news sorry about that, and other newspapers. <laughs> She's the editorial director for the publication of the second Doom's Book and has spoken before on land ownership in the House of Lords. Fiona. Hi. I'm going to sit here, if that's okay, because I quite like the table. If you can't hear me at any point, if you just start waving your hands, and I should try and speak up a bit. What I want to talk about is who owns Britain, who cares? Does ownership matter? And what is the key factor regarding the use of land that is so desirable? Because I feel that if we could be sure as to why land ownership is important and matters to us, we're in a better position to think of new ways around problems that we perceive to be inherent in it. So a, a scenario to consider, you are Noah and the Noah family, and you're coming down off Mount Ararat, and you see a lovely green and pleasant land, uh, very well watered looking. You have your flock of two, your herd of two, your goats and your chickens and so forth. 
what can you do? You can pretty much do what you want because everything is there. There's no competition for the resources. It's all yours. You'll probably wander around, have a nice time, move on when you feel like it. But over the years, as uh, the flocks multiply and your family multiplies and the world becomes more populated, you're going to find that there's more competition for land. So you have a choice. <coughs> Are you going to take the sort of gypsy nomad route where you fish in the rivers and trap rabbits and take to the open road? You don't actually own anything, but you have the use of everything. Or are you going to take the Englishman in his castle approach with your portcullis down, your defences up, maybe twitching the, the curtains of your turrets? Because who has more rights of enjoyment of land? Your free-roaming rabbit trapper or your mortgage to the hilt castle dweller who, who owns outright, maybe, with, uh, with the freehold with the mortgage, but is very much tied to a single location and perhaps goes on holiday once or twice a year with any spare cash left over. It's when people haven't got anywhere to live, that's quite a desirable position, but I'm not sure it's the ideal one to aim for. It's the old tension between security and freedom, the giving up of essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety. If you do that, you deserve neither liberty nor safety, said uh, Franklin. Uh, security of ownership, I would say, doesn't necessarily equate to freedom of use of the land one lives upon. From an e ecological point of view, it might be a good thing that a huge amount of land is tied up in huge private estates and not built upon in a sprawling urban jungle. However, it's the unequal access to land, and I can wind Kevin up because we work <laughs> together. <laughs> it's the unequal access to land use that remains. Now, laws brought in in the 1950s have very much put a stop to that roaming around the country. I think they were designed to stop gypsy, to herd gypsies into reservation style settlements on bad land and so on. And Thatcherite anti uh, New Age traveller reforms have sort of finished off that process. So it's very difficult to just wander around pitching up wherever you feel like the police will put a stop to it. So you don't have, in this country at least, it's a lot freer in Scotland. You can camp pretty much everywhere except, I think, the banks of Loch Lomond. I think that might be the only spot where you can't camp. Um, uh, if you buy your own land, can you be turfed off it? No, but you can't necessarily live on it either. If you want to construct dwellings on agricultural land, you have to have planning permission. If you want to change the use of the land or the buildings from agricultural use, you need planning permission. Not all agricultural land is the same anyway. The agricultural land classification has five grades, uh, which grades uh, one to five desirability of the land from the point of view of producing crops. I think 21% is grades one and two, which is your, your good farming land for crops and food crops, pharmaceutical crops and so on. 21% is grade 3A, which is so-so, which leaves 58% of less productive land. Well, it, it might be useful for other things, but my, my point is simply that it's no good just saying this is agriculture, that isn't. You really start need to be picky about that. Um, the off-grid movement has been quite an interesting phenomenon, I think. A lot of people, I think this started in America, have decided they would like to live independent <coughs> lives of the big service companies, the gas, electric, and so, so forth. And they, they, will find, they will either be nomadic or they will have a dwelling in the woods or whatever that belongs to them. And no one can touch them on it. You need a water source of your own and so forth. I think it's one of those libertarian things that has managed to link the far right and the far left and has brought about a bit of a paradox, uh, the broadband paradox, whereby you, you have your mobile home with a solar panel on a roof so that you can run your laptop uh, and run your online business from it while not actually being dependent on big oil companies. I, have, I, I see the attraction of it but I'm not entirely sure that it really deals with the root problems of, of ownership, corporate ownership and empowerment of grassroots movements. So 
All this is leading towards, in my mind, <laughs> a move away from freedom through ownership of land to freedom through access to the use of land. So what if all of the benefits of land ownership, security of tenure, freedom from interference, could be delivered in a responsible, community-centric way, sort of like a kibbutz with more privacy? What does freedom of land use actually mean? Financial security isn't implicit in home ownership anyway. The rate of repossessions uh, should show this, although they've dropped slightly in the past couple of years. Still roughly a quarter of a million repossession claims made every year. The Lib Dems have come up with that new initiative about renting for 30 years and then being able to, to take ownership of the house uh, that you've been renting. I think this is probably... It sounds like a very good thing if it can be made to work. I would question how much flexibility it gives people. How easy is it going to be to sell that house and still retain the... I don't know how they're going to handle the equity side of things, but it, it's a nice idea. Um, yeah, a lot of being said about property, rental and ownership models on the continent with more people renting as the norm. There are signs that that is changing as house prices change over there. I think um, house uh, in Berlin, say, Germany is traditionally somewhere where people will rent rather than buy. And in Berlin, I understand that's still very much the case. Uh, but in the countryside where property is a bit cheaper, people are, are buying much more commonly. Which gets me onto the buy-to-let phenomenon. Um, as of October 2014, private landlords were owning almost one in five homes in, this, in Britain. And the rush to buy-to-let has pushed house prices up forcing more people to stay renting. Two million private landlords rent out five million properties. 18% of households now rent from private landlords. House buying in itself is up. Uh, 2014 was up by 11% on 2013 in terms of the number of loans. Uh, put to house buyers, but this isn't proportionate across the different types of people getting loans made. So number of loans to first-time buyers was up by 15% on 2013, although the value, the monetary value of those loans was up by 24%, uh, which shows how prices are shooting. Uh, those moving house was uh, the loans were only up by 8%, remortgaging down 6%, but buy-to-let was up 23%, and that also will include people who were transferring their mortgage from a, home, a regular homeowner mortgage to a buy-to-let mortgage. So a massive increase in buy-to-let has correlated over the past few years with house price rises. Now... Back in 2013, the Council of Mortgage Lenders said that buy-to-let loans were increasing due to an increase in mortgage supply, which was linked to the government's funding for lending scheme. Now, restricting the supply of affordable housing by making it cheaper and easier for citizens to make more money by renting to their poorer brethren in the country, I would say, is not equitable. So if you're faced with a choice between paying off your landlord's mortgage or competing with them to get on the ladder yourself, is there any alternative? Now, there's social housing, which is a great thing, and affordable housing is all very well as well. But I would say they are, they're certainly not grassroots enterprises, things that people can do for themselves. And collective action is something I think is a wonderful thing, very underrated these days. So how about something sustainable with awareness of environmental sensitivity that won't penalise people for having more initiative than cash? This brings me to community land trusts, which are fairly new, and they're not very well known, certainly in urban areas. They're most concentrated in the southwest, East Anglia, the northwest around Merseyside, the Lake District, Lincolnshire, Wales. As the name suggests, if you're not familiar with them, 
and they're, community, they're a community-centric solution, providing land and buildings to meet the needs of a community. They provide permanently affordable housing, meeting spaces, workspaces, shops, farms, gardens, and they hold the assets in trust. Now, there is one in Lewisham that is in the, in the process of trying to procure a lease, a 250-year lease, from Lewisham Council that's in direct competition with, <coughs> with the open markets, so with developers. They're getting funding, uh, they're getting loan uh, to, to make the purchase, and they're hoping to create 30 dwellings with different types of tenure. There'll be people who will be renting, and there'll be people who will be doing part buying. So the property will never leave the community, but your equity can be bought and sold in it. Uh, yeah, they're currently developing the allocations policy, because I'd quite like to have seen that. <coughs> Funding, so it's run by... It's a non-profit organisation. It's run by volunteers. They've got some funding coming from the GLA, which administers on behalf of the Homes and Communities Agency, which is designed to facilitate this sort of action. Uh, the Lewisham one, set up by a group of friends and family who've all been involved in housing, or many of them have been involved in housing co-ops in the past. They've got 150 members. They'd like 1,000. Um, <coughs> Lewisham was a place where the Walter Siegel houses were built back in the 70s, sort of self-built houses. This would change slightly in that it isn't a question of people just buying their own little plot in the initiative, building their own house. I think the idea is that the community will build the entire community together. I don't, is there anyone here from the Lewisham? Anyone? Because you'd be better talking about this than I am, actually. Um, <laughs> um, but the other initiatives, it's not just urban plots. Uh, St Minver CLT in Cornwall helped, has helped young families build their own affordable homes. Uh, it's a little booklet that you can get online on just community land costs in a nutshell. Uh, Home-baked CLT in Liverpool refurbished derelict houses and set up a community-owned bakery. Uh, uh, CLT in Cumbria was busy building housing when the local pub closed, so they took that over as well. And a community farm was set up by Ashfield CLT in, in Wales alongside affordable housing. So I don't have answers on how land ownership can be transformed, but I do think it's important to take a step not only to think about who's owning all the land and is that fair, but to think why land ownership really matters. Is it the ownership we specifically want or is it access to secure access to, to homes and housing that can be obtained in some other way by thinking a little more laterally? Next speaker is Tony Gosling. Um, I'll just read out. Tony is. Tony has worked as a researcher and journalist for BBC local radio stations, publishing online research on the Bilderberg conferences. After coordinating Oxford's The Land is Ours, a land rights campaign in the 1990s, including Wandsworth, St George's Hill, Diggers Occupations, he is now a freelance investigative radio journalist and writer based in Bristol. So Does anyone here remember Greater London Radio? Because that's where I worked uh, back in the early 1990s in um, Marilyn High Street, which was quite a interesting busy newsroom. I think one of the things that doesn't get talked about enough to do with land rights is t land tenure. What, uh, what is the, your uh, rights on that land? What are they? Uh, uh, w whether it's a freehold, a leasehold, or what they used to have, the traditional type of land tenure was a copyhold. Uh, that equivalent of the copyhold is still exists in Scotland today in the croft crofting movement, which is passed on from one person in the family to another. The great thing about that is it means you can't put that property up as collateral against a bank loan and you can't lose it. So that's the key thing about the old copyholds which were a part of the op open field system, the pre-enclosure way that land was used. And I don't think there's enough understanding of the rights and the way in which, you know, the deal basically w by which we hold land. Uh, but I don't, the other thing is with land, you can't, I don't think, talk about it without 
thinking about money at the same time and the money system and the way the money's used uh, because uh, it's, it's kind of... Uh, as you're deprived of your land, you become more dependent on the money system. And it's interesting how the English Civil War, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, it was after the English Civil War that the Bank of England was incorporated and that the money system really started to take a hold of us because before that, um, land was a free gift to mankind and it was seen like that generally amongst the public. This is a free gift for everybody and we've got to share it. Anybody that decides that they're going to exclude people from it uh, is wrong. Now, uh, the diggers in the English Civil War talked about it as a common treasury for all, but basically the same thing. So if you start privatising land, if you start saying I own it, and that's what this title of this uh, uh, meeting is about today, who owns the land, originally it was the divine right of kings. So the king and the feudal system held the land in God's name for us. Uh, but it was, this is a c crucial thing to, I think, to understanding. And many, many cultures around the world still, particularly, for example, the Brazilian landless movement, the MST, understand this very well. This is something that is not like uh, a car or a wheel or something you produce yourself. This is something which we have to hold in trust. So that's the key, the key thing, I think, in understanding anything to do with land rights and ownership is we don't own land. Land is not property like anything else. We have to share it if we're going to survive as a species, which you're know, looking at the situation now. God knows whether we will or not. Um, the other thing about houses is how much do they cost to build and how much do they cost to buy? The separation of the two is getting greater and greater and greater. Uh, and so we're being excluded from the idea of... I mean, how much does it cost to build a semi-detached house? Something like probably 70, 80,000 pounds in terms of materials and uh, man hours, woman hours, whatever, to build it, it costs something like that. But to buy it in London now, well, it's, you know, we're, we're getting into a fancy land, and at some point, that bubble is going to reset. It's got to reset. We can't carry on like this forever with these artificially high house prices. So as for uh, the campaign, The Land Is Ours, uh, after I'd finished at the BBC, I went on to do help organise uh, a protest in Wandsworth in 1996, which lasted for six months by the side of Wandsworth Bridge. The idea there being that it was a, a Guinness site which was derelict. There were plans for luxury houses. It was great fun as well because we organised coaches on a magical mystery tour and about 300, 400 people turned up on the site and took over the site within the space of a day or a few hours. And we held on to it for six months and built... Uh, little eco shacks and in fact we had about 20 25 people living there the meetings there were pretty interesting we had, a we had a daily meeting where there were about half the number of people there are in the room here in a big circle deciding how we were going to manage the land and deal with various difficulties and it was a street drinking area so it wasn't easy managing the fact that there were so many casualties from society damaged people turning up on site who needed somewhere to live uh, and then St George's Hill in 1999 was more fun again. That was going right into the heart of the beast. Anyone that knows anything about uh, the English Civil War and what happened to, uh, to uh, St George's Hill, which is where the diggers uh, in 1649 decided to do a little protest, which is sort of echoes through history, uh, is now like the Beverly Hills of Britain, a private gated estate. And so we went into there. Uh, we trespassed onto the land, much to the consternation of the police, and and brought a mobile village in in a little truck and managed to get that past their security too. So we set up in there for about 10 days. But, I mean, the idea really is political theatre. Let's do things which actually have a resonance and draw people in to discuss the issues and have a bit of fun at the same time. Maybe, you know, doing something which is a little bit of civil disobedience. Actually, the local cops after the end, yeah, we were almost sorry to see us go because it was a, an excuse to engage, sit around the fire, chat about stuff. And we added a bit of life to St George's Hill. There were even people living up there who were coming to us and saying, thank God you're here because we've got the Russian mafia moving in and we, you know, we'd like to chat to someone about it and we don't like it <laughs> here anymore. And the character is changing. So there was all sorts of stuff that came out just by doing something like that. And of course, we're in a crazy situation where so much land isn't registered, in order to find out who owns a piece of land, you have to squat it. Once you squat it, you get court papers and you find out who owns it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the only way. Land registry won't tell you. 
And then you have a very close look at the deeds and, all right, is this fake or what? Is this real? So, anyway, after that, I started looking into these Bilderberg conferences because someone came up to me at Wandsworth and said, this is an interesting organisation. And I was a bit annoyed at never having heard of them. Uh, and so I just put up some membership lists I got from Reuters' internal uh, article database on the internet, and things went crazy from there on, really. I mean, I've, there's a whole website I built up over the years. But really, the Bilderberg conferences are the kind of other end of the spectrum, if you want. It's a kind of corporate, NATO, arms industry, banking, political lobby, but within the NATO countries, pretty much, that they have their own ideas about the way they want the world to go, and they're not our ideas. Uh, they're certainly much more towards the corporate end of things. And they're the people that are pushing this privatisation. The privatisation of land into, into things like... I mean, they privatised the water. They have privatised the water, I think, haven't they? Uh, as much as they can, they want us to pay for those basic things that we need in life. And that is totally against my principles. You, we, should have, we should have all the basics. And then they should be taxing the luxuries. Absolutely fine. Tax a yacht, by all means, but don't tax bread. Don't tax the land. These are basic, pr fundamental principles of any decent human being, in my, in my view. Uh, and I think also with the, uh, with the uh, Bilderbergs, um, it's well worth looking into these people because the organisation was chaired for the first 20 years, from the mid-50s to the mid-70s, by Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, who was a former SS officer. Uh, they are supposedly uh, representing us uh, and they're representing the United States and all these countries and yet there you've got this guy who slipped off his SS uniform and he's chairing the meeting. I mean, he, he then married, he married into the Dutch royal family and uh, I would argue that he was one of the traitors uh, with the Arnhem campaign back in 1944, the disastrous uh, attempt to liberate Holland. He sent in a guy who was supposed to be helping us to liaise with the Dutch resistance, and it turned out to be a, a he went straight to the Abwehr. He turned out to be a, a Nazi agent. So, but Bernhard, a bit of a dodgy character. And then also, and then also uh, Lord Carrington, who was also involved in the Arnhem battle. He then also later went, later went on to chair the Bilderberg conferences. So, I mean, I do take this quite dualistic point of view. You know, there's us, and then there's them. Uh, also, going a bit more back into the history, I think, Trying to get a historical view is critical here in understanding how we got in the mess we are today. So, 1086, thank you very much. The Norman yoke, right? Doomsday book. Please remember, when they started going around this country, uh, basically doing a catalogue of uh, an inventory of everything everyone was doing so they could tax it, there were riots in certain parts of Britain where they said, we're not having this. This is not what we want government to do after the Normans had taken over. And there was a, a, immense efforts to stop them compiling this doomsday book uh, as well in different parts of Britain. Uh, so uh, and if you're going to take a, few, a, little, a little flight through history, very important, I think, also to look at events like Ketch Rebellion in East Anglia in, in 1549, massive anti-enclosure rebellion stopping privatisation of land by Robert Ket. Uh, and I noticed there's seal stuff in, in and around Norwich, if you're ever up there, there's, there's a, a whole load of kind of mem memories of that, where the entire East Anglia was being run from underneath an oak tree for about two months, and the king sent an army against them, and the peasants beat the army back, and the king had to send a second army against them. So they were saying, look, this is not private property, this is common land. Get out of the way, king. But uh, unfortunately, Robert Kett was hanged. Uh, off of the, I think it was by chains off the walls of Norwich. So he came a cropper like m many of these people do eventually. But a fascinating bit of history and very important. Then we come to the English Civil War, which I mentioned briefly earlier on. And I would just have to wave this in front of your noses. If anyone's ever seen this book or ever come across it, it's uh, N.H. Brailsford's book, The Levelers and the English Revolution. Because Christopher Hill's done a great job uh, with the world turned upside down. But this is also a really beautiful piece of research into the nuts and bolts of what was really going on in the Civil War. Because, of course, it was a con. The whole thing was a way of getting everybody to fight the, the king. And that's really the key of what I wanted to say today. Is, and there's a little handout I've got here for anyone who wants to see me afterwards. I would posit that the reason the Civil War happened was because enclosure, privatisation of land, had been being stopped by James I and Charles I. And I'll just read you a short quote from a book, The English Village Community and the Enclosure Movements, from 1848.
from 1967. From about 1607 to 1636, the government pursued an active anti-enclosure policy. If the reign in its social and agrarian policy might be judged solely from the number of anti-enclosure commissions set up, then undoubtedly King Charles I is the one English monarch of outstanding importance as an agrarian reformer. What Charles I was doing is he was saying, well, hang on a minute, these people are, uh, we've got our peasants living under ditches across the country, and we're not having this, and these merchant classes that were doing this privatisation, the enclosure, are making a fortune. I'm going to tax them. His big mistake, though, Charles I, was that he actually started fining and taxing people. They called them, uh, oh, gosh, a composure or something? I'm not sure exactly what. Anyway, had a different compositions, they called them, the fines, were imposed on landowners who had enclosed their land three or four years before, while it was still legal. But he was still imposing fines on those people who'd done it years before. Now, if I was a merchant and I'd enclosed my land, privatised my land, kicked off the peasants and turned it over to my own private property to make money and grow food or whatever, sheep often, I would be rather pissed off with the king for, for <laughs> fining me for doing something that three years ago was perfectly legal. And I think that's one of the reasons that the, uh, the merchant classes at the beginning of the Civil War started to get organised against the king and say, we're not having this. Also, this, we're on a right, nice little number. The other thing, of course, is, remember, at the time, was beginning of the urbanisation of factories. And so all these landless peasants were coming into the cities and working in factories and beginning to be the sort of, in, you know, beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, or at least the very first start. I mean, we're talking about the Agricultural Revolution there, really. Uh, so I think that's you know, a, a, one of the big reasons. In a way, Winstanley and the Diggers did a great job, I think, in picking up on this, even though they maybe didn't realise what had been going on behind the scenes in the run-up to the Civil War. Uh, one thing I would also uh, point to is the 1880s, a rather big time in land rights, uh, because you've got the Irish Land League and the Scottish Highland Clearances. The Irish Land League, to answer Fiona in a way, is a really good example of how you do it, because... The, in Ireland, they had what the Lib Dems at the moment would be absolutely, well, be, be gagging for, which is they held the balance of power, the Irish MPs, and they used the balance of power in the 1880s to do what? To push for government loans to buy and build their own homes in Ireland. And so what happened was people were getting cheap loans to, because remember we just had the famines, for goodness sake, to take the land off of the hands of the absentee landowners and to own their own homes. It's why Ireland now is such a lot of uh, small peasant farmers, or small, well not peasants, but small farmers all over the place. It's because they managed to get that out of <coughs> the settlement for the coalition government that they went into. They said, we'll support you. I think it was the Whigs they were supporting, but only if you get us this. And, and what they did is they turned all those leases that they had in Ireland over into private ownership. And that's a, a really good example, a very simple way of how you redistribute land and you stop rack-renting landowners. Uh, in Scotland, it was probably even as horrific with people being torn out of their homes in the Highland Clearances. Uh, but I would, I suppose, like to finish with just a couple of book recommendations. This, is, this land is our land. It's, very, it's one of the best, Marion Shored. I am actually managed to get my mother-in-law to republish it because I'd waited for three <laughs> months to get a copy of this from a library in South London. Uh, and there were three people before me who had it, were in the queue. So uh, my mother-in-law's publisher, I said, why don't you publish, republish it? And Marion Shaw's book's fantastic, forward by George Monbiot. This land is our land, the struggle for Britain's countryside. Uh, terrific read, good old Marion. And the other one is, uh, is this present publication, which Simon Fairley uh, in, down in uh, Devon uh, publishes every quarter, I think, which is the Land Magazine, which you might even see an article by me in here from time to time, which is, uh, is really kind of keeping track of, I suppose, a, a sort of lo what they call low-impact development, which is people who have decided that they want to live lightly on the earth. Uh, so I think that, that, that'll do. Uh, as regards campaigning, <coughs> the land is ours. It still sort of exists. But ultimately, I think the real inheritors of Gerard Wynne Stanley, the Irish Land League, the people that fought the Highland Clearances, I see them all across our urban cities. They are the squatters. 
the people who have not given in to Ken Clark and said we're not going to squat places because we're not allowed to squat residential anymore. They're squatting industrial buildings, they're squatting anything that's not residential, but they're still squatting. And there are hundreds of thousands of them across this country that keep their heads down. They're Win Stanley's people today. Thanks for listening. I'm going to introduce our fourth and final speaker, who's Yoni Higgsmith. I hope I said that right. Um, Yoni is Communications Director of the Labour Land Campaign, a cross-labour movement campaign to promote land reform policy and theory. He has produced and directed a number of land reform films, and in late 2014 he became General Secretary of the Professional Land Reform Group, promoting land reform within professional circles. So we've got a couple of questions. You know, what is land is the most important one to start with. So about a year ago, we were contacted by a group called earthsharing.org. They're an American-based uh, outfit, but they have uh, contacts around the world. And they wanted us to create a film that asked questions about land and ownership um, to Londoners, because London's obviously there's a lot of issues to with land and ownership right here. So we found a group of 11 different Londoners um, from different diverse backgrounds, <laughs> ages, and we asked them to choose a place that they connected with so we could film them there, and we created a montage film. So uh, I think the highlights included being in the back of a London cab, you know, interviewing the cabbie, which often happens, and uh, driving around Buckingham Palace areas, and he was just talking about what he felt. Uh, we also interviewed people in their homes and in gardens and, and uh, the skates park at the South Bank. Um, some of the responses about what is land from them are, uh, land is the ground not in sea. This was an eight-year-old, um, I think he, he, got the, he got the gist. Um, his old sister said, well, there is land at the bottom of the sea, but we'll, we'll pass that for now. Um, land is what belongs to us as a people. Land is mother nature. Land is the most valuable thing on the planet. Land is everything beneath our feet, and that includes natural resources. So there's a lot of questions there. Um, the Labour Land Campaign, uh, we are a cross-labour movement activist group promoting land reform, we say uh, no human being has made land, uh, and the value of a piece of land derives from such things as natural fertility, mineral deposits, and its position in relation to public utilities, natural harbours, uh, communications, and population. So just taking a contemporary example, satellites. So uh, the UK is the world market leader in uh, microsatellites through the University of Surrey. Um, obviously the satellites are made by humanity uh, and they're used for observation and communications. But who owns the view that they observe and who owns the radio spectrum that they communicate through? So for the Labour Land Campaign, we'd say that you know, we own, the, well, the, uh, the land element is the spectrum and the observation. That's all included within land. It's not man-made. But, um, but the land value derives from the fact that we can use that communication spectrum, that we have access to it through the satellites. So uh, who owns land? There's been a lot of uh, conversation about that today. There's a legal definition, uh, but the questions go beyond the legality. So uh, let's look at fracking. So fracking, for, I think most people probably know, but it's uh, about drilling into the earth with high pressure water and, and fracturing the land, which uh, produces gas, there's natural gas hidden in there, and it comes back up through, and that, that's what fracking is. So um, who here, uh, let's imagine that you've got an, a load of gas found under your home. Uh, put up your hand if you think you get to keep the gas. <laughs> no? Okay. Um, well, that's good. Since 1998, you wouldn't. Before then, you actually would have done that with the Section 2 of the Petroleum Act, which says the Crown gets to keep your gas. But there are wider questions about, you know, do you have the right to say if an energy company can drill under your home? You know, do you get some compensation because you've got a home there? Um, do you get cheaper energy prices? You know, so th these kind of questions, they're a bit more complicated, and there are, there are different arguments about whether or not fracking is good in the first place. But these questions about who owns the rights to what's happening around your home, if you own your home, that's important. So um, I'm going to talk about land value, because that's what the Labour Land Campaign is all about. Um, there, are four, there are lots of things that make land value fluctuate. I'm only going to talk about four of them, because of limited time. Um, the four I'm going to talk about are population, speculation, location and resources. So population, the more people we have, the more competition there is. Um, I actually learned most of this from David Triggs, who's sitting right here, so I thank you for this. <laughs> but um, but uh, there we ha now have 300,000 more people in the UK each year, um, and we have about 100,000, that includes births and people moving around and that kind of thing. Um, in London, we have 100,000 more people coming here every year from the, from the country and from, from outside the country. So you can imagine that that's 
puts a massive <coughs> strain on what we actually have available here. House prices here are massive compared to the rest of the country. Um, generally in the world, they're massive. I don't know of any other countries that have 100,000, cities that have 100,000 more people arriving every year. And that's something we have to account for. It's policies we don't have in place at the moment. Uh, speculation. Land banking holds land out of use. Um, in itself, doing that will actually raise the value of land because there's, it creates scarcity. Um, but, but it's beyond that. People speculate because they believe later on it'll be worth more money and they can do better than, than let's, say, let's say you've got an empty home uh, and you don't want to pay the maintenance cost of someone actually living in that home. You know, because someone lives in your home, you have to then pay for you know, things that go wrong in the house, all that kind of stuff. If you just leave it pristine, you're holding it out of use. But as the land goes up in value, you can speculate, you can earn more money. So this is a tremendous problem for us now. We have 610,000 uh, empty homes in England. This is of October 2014. <coughs> and 200,000 of these have been empty for longer than six months. So these aren't people just, you know, well, they're in the middle. This is, this is a real problem we're facing. Uh, we need to build 300,000 homes a year to catch up with the housing deficit created by selling off all of the homes during the help to buy sort of schemes, um, and also that we haven't built enough social housing. Um, so, uh, so obviously we, we've got a problem with that, and we need to think about how to halt speculation, stop it generally. So location, and access to location as well. I want you to consider that there was an amazing city. It's got incredible organic food that's right, grown right next to you. It's got the best transport system you can imagine. There's personal chauffeurs who drive <coughs> gasless cars. You know, the, the only emission is water. It's just amazing. You, know, you, you can take it further yourself, but just imagine this amazing city. Uh, but because of some imaginative natural disaster, the only way to get to that city is by swimming for two hours underneath a sort of underground tunnel that only fits one person with very limited air and you can't take any of your belongings with you. How much would you pay rent there? You know, and that's the point. It is all about location. Sometimes you will pay to live not necessarily right by the hub of things you want to live by. You'll live further out, but it's got a great cross-rail link. So suddenly, that's a more valuable place to live. Okay, finally, uh, we're going to look at resources, which are both natural and humanity-created. If you're in agriculture, you've got to ask questions like, how fertile is my land? Um, uh, is there a river nearby? Uh, are we landlocked? You know, can we actually sell the produce we make? How does that work? Um, with residential, we ask, is there a nearby transport links, as mentioned before? Um, are there schools for the kids and are there hospitals? <coughs> and for businesses, we're talking about things like, uh, th this applies to homes as well, but high-speed internet, um, is there access to financial services and jobs? <coughs> So uh, there's a, an example that's often used by, by people in the movement, but I'm going to mention again here because it's a good one. Um, in 1999, the Jubilee Line extension was built. It costed £3.5 billion pounds, uh, of tax funds. Along the route, homes with a 300 metre radius of each station got £200,000 windfall gain. This, yeah, Crosshill will be similar, I'm sure, uh, because that's how it works. Um, and th those increased land values in the windfall they were unearned windfall gains, and they went to a small uh, handful of, of private freeholders um, a, a, instead of going to the community as a whole. Um, and if you consider two households next to each other, one's a, you know, the, the renters, we'll call them, and one's the freeholders, not very imaginative names, but you understand. Um, the renters find that their rent goes up um, and that their life is harder. Let's imagine they have the same earnings, they have the same spendings, everything else is the same, but one owns the land and one doesn't. Um, the freeholders gain an unearned windfall of more than a lifetime in taxes back. Um, you know, they can borrow money because banks want to lend them more money because they've got land collateral. They've got options. And this bit is crucial. You see, we've got earned income versus unearned income. That's, that's really the crux of what we're talking about when we're talking about land and ownership from, the, from our perspective. Um, if a small group gain an unearned windfall living and aren't contributing to society for the privilege, uh, we engender inequality. That's how we create this 1% scenario that's being discussed. Um, and income inequality is less uh, protracted than inequality based on who owns <coughs> land. So if we were to collect that windfall, uh, the unearned value, and pay for infrastructure through that, we'd all get to enjoy better services, and a small group wouldn't be getting a free ride from the rest. So it's not just who owns land, but who also who benefits, and what are the implications? So uh, I've, I've coined a lovely phrase, which I, I think is not too complicated, unearned by individual efforts, all hyphenated, which is very simple. So who, earns the, who owns the unearned by individual efforts value of land? 
just let that sit with you because it's a lovely turn of phrase. But economics, uh, they call it economic rent because it's much easier. So unearned by individual efforts, economic rent. Um, I'd like to consider that because we all participate in the creating of this, of this uh, economic rent, we own it. And that what we should be doing is nationalizing it in the form of leasing it annually. That, that's, that's the crux of what land value tax is. Uh, it's a tax on unearned income. Uh, ideally, it will replace taxes on earned income as well, because these will help create a better economy for everyone. Um, and uh, the more money it raises, the more money we can move over, and we call that tax shift. So we're, we want to take uh, taxes away from earned and move on to unearned. Um, so uh, I don't have, with I've got about a minute left, so uh, I can't go into depth about how brilliant land value tax is, uh, but just to check if I'm on the same page as other people in the room, uh, put up your hand if you would like a tax that promotes better uses of land for the whole community. <laughs> Great. Uh, would you like a tax that regulates, uh, regulates and makes more affordable house prices? Good. Okay. And uh, encourages tax shift away from earnings, so we can all have a bit more earnings. Okay, pretty much. Okay, good. If you want to learn about how land value tax does that, you can go to our website, labourlandcampaign.org. Uh, you can find resources on the topics, links, articles, papers, and information about LBT in the news. You can become uh, a member and join the campaign. There are also many other organisations that do things. The Coalition for Economic Justice is an umbrella movement that takes all different party and all different uh, faith and etc. groups who are interested. They've also got resources you can use. Um, and I just want to summarise my last 20 seconds. Uh, so what is land? There are many answers. Uh, do watch landbyearthsharing.org, which is on YouTube. Um, you can have a think for yourselves. Two, what are the implications of land ownership on wealth and inequality? Um, land value is currently collected by landowners and represents an unearned income that engenders inequality. Our system of taxation is also culpable in creating a sterile context where landowners win and non-landowners lose. Is there a suitable alternative? Yes, tax shift away from taxation on earnings as this harms the economy, move towards the non-earning taxes and incentivize the economy and solve those problems in our country. And if you want to get more involved, come to the Labour Land campaign. Thank you. <laughs>60, 70 years massively from people that work in the countryside to people who've made their money in the cities and are now urban incomers. Also, historically, mass depopulation. You drive through or take a train through Wiltshire, you'll find hardly anybody in it in the countryside. I think this is where Simon, Fairley, and the low-impact development people come in. They, they want to repopulate the countryside mm. in a way which is not going to damage the countryside. It's not going to be... Uh, putting urban style dwellings back in the countryside. It's about reconnecting people with the land because we're, our cities are dying. They were created for an industrial nation that doesn't exist anymore. Thank you very much. David Triggs, I'm the chairman of the Henry George Foundation, which is an educational charity devoted to this very topic, essentially. Um, I'd like, if I may, to mm. try and draw a few threads yeah, together yes, which I've picked up from this, and really starting with um, uh, what, what, what we heard with regard to who owns the land. Um, the Crown owns the land, which means our nation owns the land. And the original concept was that those others that held the land owed a duty to the king in respect of the protection that the king provided to the landholders. And the essence of what these days is called land value tax, which I believe is actually a completely inaccurate name, 
because in fact it's not a tax. It is a reflection of the feudal dues that were always due. It's a location fee would reflect the protection upon which the value of land absolutely depends. Without security of tender, no land will have any value whatsoever. As we see throughout the world today, with the breakdown of law and order and the protection that that provides, no location would have any value whatsoever. So the key service that the community and the government renders that those that hold the land is protection. And that protection is very, very costly. The whole of the infrastructure, the whole of the defence system, the whole of the law and order system requires to be paid for, and it can be paid for out of what I'm terming a location <coughs> fee. Mm. And if I may take a moment to explain why so-called land value tax is not a tax. By definition, <coughs> and one of the post-war Labour Chancellor, uh, Dalton, uh, am I Dalton, is it Dalton? Yeah, Dalton, identified a tax very clearly in his book, The Principles of Political Economy, in which he identified a tax which is a compulsory payment on people irrespective of the benefit that they receive. Our current systems of taxation, taxing people for working, taxing people for using their capital, taxing people for spending, tax taxing people for selling, all are totally unrelated to the benefits that the taxpayers receive. The concept of location fee would collect that uh, value of location, the value of the land, mind, not the value of the buildings. It's the value of the land or the location that is really critical. And if I may take a moment to explain why we talk in terms of location fee rather than even a land rent. And this is because of the sight people have lost, or the, the loss of sight, that has taken place in the urban situation. <coughs> because the urban situation is where, as has been pointed out, all the land value is, where all the protection is required, where all the competition for the locations exists. And as has been pointed out, this location value is a value that is created entirely by the presence protections, permissions, and services that the community as a whole provides. The location value is not due to anything that the current holder of the land does, mm. or any of his predecessors have done. It's created by the whole community. It is thus due to the whole community. And if it is not collected and is allowed to be go into the pockets of individual landholders, we get the problems that we've got today, largely on account of <coughs> being privatised, and we're not now talking about privatising the land, we're talking about privatising location value. When it's privatised, it now becomes collateral. It now becomes an object that you want now to store. And so land requires a capital value, as distinct from a rental value, purely because it's privatised. Being privatised, an individual can buy and sell this claim to the land. As a consequence of that, it acquires a capital value, which is an estimate of perpetual future rental streams coming in. Now, the idea of collecting location value as a community resource, as public revenue, is that it doesn't accumulate at all. It doesn't accumulate in any individual pocket, so it's not something to speculate in. It's not something that's worth owning, but it's certainly worth renting. And so the idea of location value or location fee is that you rent the land on an agreed lease, 
but the property on it is entirely <coughs> private, um, privately owned. Mm. But the other most important point that I would like to just emphasize mm. is the insidious nature of the tax system that we have. The whole idea, you see, location value, the value that people are prepared to give to occupy a location is not determined by any value that's created there. Homes illustrate that. It's created by what people are prepared to bid against each other to have exclusive possession of it. Exclusive protected possession of it. But what they can afford to bid is their after-tax earnings, apart from the very wealthy. So the whole concept of the taxes that we currently have reduces what people can bid to use the land. And as such, if you were to remove income tax, VAT, corporation tax, and other taxes on labour and capital and enterprise, reduce those, then the, the funds available to fund the land become much, much greater. But of course, what also enters into this then is the government's responsibility for managing the land how the land may be used. Here we come to matters such as the green belt, such as what land is going to be made available for housing, what available land available for manufacture, what for farming, and if we really want a viable farming industry, then again we decide this is what this land is to be used for, what am I bid? If you've decided that you want the land to be used in such and such a way, and you're not bid anything positively, and you still want to use it, then you have a negative bid, which of course amounts to a negative location fee. But if you want really to manage the estate of the UK, UK that's the sort of tap and integrated service or management system that you need to introduce you've got to take into account not only public revenue implications and the needs of the community, housing, farming and the rest, but also that how the land is, is, to, is to be used. So integrating the whole thing. The planning system as it stands at the moment imposes winners and losers. The introduction of a location fee would eliminate that because the winners, so-called winners of a planning dispute would incur a higher location fee. The so-called losers would incur a lower mm -hmm. location fee. And lo and behold, the community as a whole now, the planning authority, can decide what gives us the net best location fee as a consequence of this decision. There's one yes. slight problem with yes, your are. proposal. Yeah. How do you <coughs> fancy paying £14,000 a year for your house in tax? That's what the land fee turns out as. And there's another thing you forget. It's called democracy. 65% of the families in this country have voted, a very expensive vote, to buy their homes. This shift that David is talking about would penalise 65% of everybody living in the country at the moment. If everybody in this room in the country read the first three chapters of that book, yeah. you would live in a totally different world. You will, you will get pulled down after about the first three or four chapters. <laughs> <laughs> Put it back on the shelf, nobody's going to give you any grief. But if you get the chance to read the first three chapters of that book, it will change your life. I've, um, I perform a show called Three Acres and a Cow, a history of land rights and protesting focused on the story. And basically, is the first three chapters of that book have broken up the folk songs and stories to make it a bit more manageable. And I've spent the last two years touring around the country telling people about land value tax and about all of the history that brings us to the present. <coughs> because you can't understand the present unless you understand the past. So looking at the past is really a good place to start. I'm not sure I'm able to weigh in on the land value tax argument. I think it's a really important one to have. Another really important one to have is subsidies. We're living in a culture at the moment where there's a lot of demonising people who receive things from the state that aren't perceived to be fair. But I can't help but notice if you change the name of something from benefit to a subsidy and you give it to rich people instead of wealthy people, <laughs> that seems to be okay. Now, £1.5 billion a year is given in public money 
to large landowners due to common agricultural policy. That's a big number. Let's think about that number. That's the same amount the legal aid tax bill is. That's a tenth of our higher education spending. And at the moment, we give that, asking nothing in return to the wealthiest landowners in this country. So I don't want to get too bogged down in land value tax. I think we all owe it to ourselves to go away and research and make our own opinions on that. But actually looking at the fact that landowners are incent incentivized to hold land and we get nothing back for that public money is important. And then another thing to look at is why are so many people from all over the world coming here and buying land? And it's important to note that a lot of countries, it's illegal to land bank. In a lot of the Arab countries, it's against their religion for somebody to just buy a patch of land and sit on it waiting yeah. to get some windfall. In Singapore, the land has to be owned by the government to have a change of plan use. So if it's turned into residential, that windfall, the value of the land being changed, goes into the public purse. So I really recommend that we need history lessons. I really recommend it's great to look around the world and see why it is that so much money is pouring into this country and depriving us of access to land and access to affordable housing. And um, I really look forward to hearing what else everybody else has to say. Great. <laughs> Heather? Uh, first of all, on the thing about that Kevin's just said, about 65% of people own their homes. I dispute that totally because there's a whole group of people that are not included in statistics. And when you talk about getting information about land ownership, also try and get information about the value of land and about who occupies the land. And it's very, very difficult. We have a growing number of young adults who live at home, not just in their 20s, but into their 30s, because they cannot afford to rent or buy. They're not a statistic in anything. We have multi-generation houses where you've got three, four generations living together. In my home, we've got three generations. My daughter's not a statistic. My grandson, who's 18, is not a statistic. And my granddaughter, who's 16, when she leaves things, she won't be a statistic. So there's a whole mass of people who do not have ownership of a home or buying a home. And I've done some figures, and I think over 40% of the population are tenants, are living at home, are um, people in the lodges, couldn't think of it, homeless people. So it's way over 40% of people are not homeowners. Those people pay their taxes equally, and those people equally generate land value. And the thing that on the land value taxes, there's a terrible injustice against people who are not homeowners, who are not landowners. Um, that's the first point. Talking about, um, when we talk about prices of homes in London being unaffordable. If you can't afford a home, if you're living in London or if you're living in Ilford or you're living in, in Inverness, if you can't afford a home, you can't afford a home. And whilst land prices <coughs> in London have soared and are very exaggerated, uh, centre point that was squatted years ago in the 80s by homeless people, now being refurbished, and flats are going to be sold at least three million pounds. Well, they might have solid gold tax with diamonds on, but sorry, I think most of that land value is because of the location value, including the crossrail that everyone in the country is paid for as taxpayers. So um, when we talk about unaffordable, remember unaffordable means unaffordable for everybody, wherever they are. People on low wages can't afford to rent. Second homes have pushed up prices in, in villages, etc. And subsidies, um, I'm glad somebody raised about subsidies because some of the biggest subsidies go to landowners. I wrote this booklet, Welfare for the Rich. Mm -hmm. Who really received the biggest subsidies in the UK? I was sick of hearing about Benefit Street and these scroungers sucking the, you know, the life out of, out of our society in terms of the subsidies they get. Well, look at the subsidies that are paid out under CAP. You won't find the landowners that receive it because most of it those landowners are not named when you go onto the, mm -hmm. onto the uh, website of the common market who receives the subsidies. Serco gets it. I didn't know there were farms, but there we go. They get huge subsidies, something over a million a year. But another huge subsidy is the nine billion a year that go as housing benefit, which ends up in private, mm. to private landlords. Mm. And sorry, but I don't think the Queen, the, uh, the Crown Estates or, or, or the Duke of Westminster, I didn't know they were into social housing, but I suppose for the Crown Estates, they probably pay such low <coughs> wages to their 
to their workers and tenants that they those homes um, qualify for for housing <coughs> benefit. But the but the help, but the subsidies that go to the the biggest subsidies actually go to landowners, direct subsidies and indirect. And as the economy grows, this, the landowner will always say, whether it's to business or to, to homes, I'll take more of that growth that you lot have created. And I sit here, I do nothing, but I'll take it as mine. So it's the land value. I mean, I certainly don't agree with the private ownership of land, but that's a political debate that's not like to win, you know, imagine the day you have when you're in your back garden. But certainly land value is a worthwhile debate and we should be discussing it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Sure, so I'd like be keen to bring us back onto track about land ownership in the UK as mm. opposed to home ownership in our campaign, which is important for separate and taxation systems. So from what I've heard this evening, I've only really heard two premises. Uh, one is that the Crown owns all the land in the UK, which is an important thing, and the other one is all the jolly little fur. So, a uh, question to the panel. Uh, what countries have you seen in practice having much better, better and in your consideration, fur approaches compared to the UK? Okay. Shall I bring a few people in before I get them back? Is that right? Who else was there? Yeah, come on. I agree uh, that some kind of land value tax or location uh, value fee, as David Trigg said, is desirable. <coughs> One of the uh, former deputies of the Bank of England, Sir John Gibbs, described it as a, a, a no brainer, but the politicians don't like it, and uh, Howard Davis. And, uh, let's, not, let's not neglect the other tax uh, advantages for land owners. Basically, inheritance tax for large estates or listed buildings since the end of the Second World War has virtually been whittled away. And if you go and actually read online about how you can, a large estate can effectively completely avoid uh, inheritance tax. I mean, that's why it is such a good tax like loss asset in, in, in many ways. It is totally stunning. I mean, if it's only got about 10, bit, 10 million, then yeah, you could get a little bit hammered by inheritance tax. But if, you, if you've got stuff, you know, a decent side of a state with, you know, a mile long wall, you don't really need to worry very much any longer. The other point is about how landlords uh, can offset with decent, decent tax arrangements their borrowing against tax, whereas ordinary uh, single mortgage holders can't. Uh, a guy who's been my friend since childhood now owns 115 semi-detached houses and some other property as well. And a couple of years ago he said, I can't believe how good it is for me now, Dave. It really can't last, I know. But I guess it's these MPs. They're a bit of a nuisance because they compete against me and push the price up. But they do pass some very useful legislation um, as well, which uh, Helps me a lot. And the other aspect we haven't really discussed is the role of the finance sector in, to quote Martin Wolf, leveraging up asset prices. If you go back and look what the banks, the finance sector is lending its money on, it comes down to about 80%. If you go back to the whole, 80% is in land property assets. And by lending more, making more money available to lend, it pushes up the prices of houses, which in turn pushes up the value of rents. So the success of the City of London, when it's not just helping uh, rich people from abroad avoid, avoid their taxes and hollow out their democracies, is effectively uh, paid for by the high rents and enormous <coughs> mortgages of uh, people across the country. And when everybody gets that, <coughs> Yeah, maybe there'll be a little bit more movement along with some reform of the land ownership to sort of resolve the problem because two million uh, people you could um, house on 30,000 acres of land which is about 120-1% of the land of the UK and that's ignoring the amount which uh, we could do by refurbishing existing property and so on, I see various people like thousand, whatever. We can have loads more immigrants if we do, if, if, if we operate those uh, sorts of principles. But um, the answers are there. It's just not quite in a few people's interest to implement those answers. Get what we 
we set here spreads around and uh, you know, maybe your grandchildren, maybe those of you who are under 40 will be able to um, have assets and property shared out which are worth what they are worth. Danny Dorley, Professor of Geography at Oxford, used to say, hey, there's going to be a big crash in house prices after the election. As it is, given Osborne's uh, allowing you to put your pension funds on, on being yes, another by a third person, probably a lot of people my age are going to lose their pensions a few years down below mm. when the uh, crash is put off for a few years. But, you know, just a bit of investment advice for you guys. <laughs> I'll say something, because you mentioned conquest there. I think it's so important to understand. I mean, for example, the, 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 one of the big changes in Britain was during the Civil War. The army got very, very involved in discussing these sorts of things, uh, the Putney debates and things like that. And it was a bit disappointing because there was a meeting, I don't know if people knew about it last weekend, about the birthday of John Lilburn, Lilburn who was yeah. one of the big activists during the Civil War, a soldier. Uh, and I was quite surprised to see that there weren't uh, people like Veterans for Peace invited to speak at that, who have a very deep understanding, actually, of history, some of them. And, um, and how the army is used to con conquer mm. right this minute, you know, in other parts of the world, places like mm. Afghanistan, Syria, wherever. Uh, the idea being to get their hands on that property. Mm. Honest John. Like private home ownership, there's nothing kind of magic about it. In the world we live in, it's the most secure form of tenure. 17.7 million people have decided that they prefer that. If you go back to history, most people won't know. Most people think the Irish potato famine, people died of fat <coughs> potatoes. They didn't. Of the million odd who died, about 600,000 perished. Because they had no <coughs> shelter. They had no roof over their head. And there's no big principal thing about this. In the world we live in, the most secure form of getting a roof over your head is to buy house with a mortgage. That's the simple answer there. You know, and all the theoretical stuff has to navigate around the fact that there are 17.7 million people who've made that choice, rightly or wrongly. I think they've made it rightly as it happens. My grandmother persuaded us the famine was serious. Um, <coughs> but the majority of the people in the Irish famine died because the landlords threw them out on the side of the road. <coughs> they didn't have, they starved as well. But the Irish winter was what killed them. If you, if you have no roof over your head, the Irish winter is very cruel. And you, there's no issue of principle. It's just a pragmatic choice. But if you're going to change everything, you have to address that. And that's what land value tax doesn't do. Kevin, do you want to address this question about other countries? Um, Countries, the con okay, uh, take two. The country with heading for the highest level of home ownership, private home ownership, was America. And of course, the crash has done terrible damage to that. But the crash in Ireland, up to the year 2000, the number of repossessions in Ireland, again, a legacy of bad land, uh, uh, you know, a shadow of bad landlords, the number of repossessions in 1999 was about six. Now it's tens of thousands. So there are risks attached, but the, the bulk of people who bought or buy their own home have a form of security in our system that you certainly don't have if you're renting. You have to change the system. The other country, the, Spain tried our system. They went on a, a private home buying <coughs> uh, binge and they ran into big problems. But the countries that were stable, uh, for instance, our own, the United Kingdom, or, uh, and Ireland, the, there are terrible tragedies now in the repossessions and everything, but the bulk of the homes are not affected. In other words, the largest number of people are not affected, but a small number of people are terribly badly affected. They're being thrown out on the side of the street. Well, one thing I would say is about Russia, um, the Russian Revolution um, was a bit of a disaster in land reform, but we, under Khrushchev, I think it was, they had a dacha system, a formal dacha system, where they offered, um, I think it's one hectare of land to everybody <laughs> in the cities out in the country. The idea being it would be a bit like France, where people would kind of go to their country house in the middle of the summer, because it's not the summer isn't all that long in Russia. Uh, and the other thing, of course, 
and that's still there today. I mean, if you ever go to Russia, I went for the first time ever last summer, and they have these kind of big collections of small holdings with these, all these dachas where people, some of them will spend their, <coughs> most of their lives out in the dacha, and others will just go there in the middle of the summer. But that was a gift to Rus the Russian people from the government back in those days. The other thing is, unlike Britain, where the Queen owns all the land, Putin doesn't own all the land. If you own your land, you own it. It's one of the very few countries where, you know, private ownership is constitutional, is Russia. <laughs> And interestingly, Russia has divided land ownership in exactly the way the United States has. It's an identical model. In the United States, the government, as a private landowner, holds a third of the country. It's, you know, government, federal government. <coughs> in Russia, it's about 48%, the, the Russian government. But the rest is private. The great forests in Siberia and everything, they're all private. And half the food eaten in Russia is grown on datchers. <coughs> so when they had a total financial disaster in 1990, it wasn't anywhere near as disastrous as it would be because you've got so many people growing their own food. Fiona, do you want to comment? Yeah, if, if, if home ownership is the secure option compared to renting, then surely that says that renting needs to be changed. And that can be done politically. It doesn't have to be a market-driven phenomenon. That, that is really what I would like to see change. I would like to see what happened. They, they used to be secure tenancies. They've gone out the window. You could help them with that. That would make a difference. If you had really good <coughs> rental set up, people wouldn't be so desperate to buy their own bricks and mortar. They wouldn't need to. They'd have all the flexibility of renting. They could follow the work as they wanted and they'd have the security of knowing they weren't going to be turfed out on their ear by people who wanted to bump the, ru the <coughs> rent up in six months' time. In terms of other countries, I suppose I'm a little bit fixated, and I might get beyond this at some point, on the idea that land use is, and access to using land is, is more important, or could be more important than owning it. Personally, I don't actually care whether the Queen owns the land I live on or not, because it makes absolutely no difference. Um, what would make a difference would be if, if someone told me actually they own the freehold and that made a difference to me. The Queen is so unlikely to come and do something that <laughs> you, you might, it may, have, it may affect how we all think constitutionally, and I'm not saying that I'm a monarchist or a Republican or whatever, I don't really want to go down that argument, but I don't think it affects me. What does affect me is what I can do if I'm walking across someone else's land if you're in Scandinavia, I don't know if this is true of all Scandinavian countries, but no, it certainly has been in Sweden, and they may have changed it now, but I know you certainly used to be able to pitch your tent in anyone's front garden, you know, polite to, to let them know you're there, but it's civilised. You're not, you're not making a land grab. I know that it's not a huge, a huge uh, population, but it's... Um, it's a fairly hostile environment, I suppose, as well, for much of the year. So maybe the entire population isn't going to go and sort of set up a, a TP in, in front gardens. But the fact that you can go and do that, you can move around and you can sort of take your home with you for maybe a month or two at a time. I just can't see that happening in this country. And I don't think it's very civilised that we all have to tie ourselves in to incredibly <coughs> uh, restrictive modes of living just to have some kind of sense of security. So I'm, I'm not convinced that ownership is going to be the solution because to me it's more of the same problem. But I realise that that doesn't address any of the issues around taxation which are very interesting to me. But I think I'm perhaps being so fundamental in my thought that I'm not getting into the subtleties of, of what other people are talking about. But I do think ownership isn't the heart of the problem. Mm. The only. Um, yeah, I'd echo that. It, ownership isn't the problem, it's about what happens because of that ownership and how we get cut out of certain things and how money is totally reliant on the land economy and that, that causes the inequality problem, which isn't exactly what we're here to talk about, but it is something that's uh, dear to all of our hearts. Um, 
I want to say a quick thing about the, the tax thing that was mentioned. I was going to mention it earlier, but I thought I'd, I'd leave up. If, um, if we stopped collecting tax in the country, there'd be loads of money in the economy and the land value would go up because um, Winston Churchill said uh, it's not the only monopoly, but land's the mother of all monopolies. You know, all the money always ends up in, in land value. Now, to the question of you know, this, this uh, house being suddenly worth you know, even £20,000 or whatever. Um, sorry, if uh, land value what costs? Yeah, that's what it would cost a year if you impose land value on now. Each, in each home moment. Yeah. I disagree with that, uh, not based on the figures we have. But, um, okay, um, so have we. Um, but we, we look at that uh, basically there's about 200 billion roughly <coughs> uh, land value available right now in, in the country. Um, that uh, wouldn't account for entire budget, which is something like five, we, we spend 700 billion and we raise 500 billion and we've got the deficit. Um, for us, it's a tax shift, so you can make it revenue neutral. If you just did it on council tax and business rates, you know, we're talking about a uh, very small amount, 4% of the entire budget. So there, there are ways we can do it in a small way first, but in our view from the Labour Land Campaign, any shift from the earned taxes to the unearned taxes uh, would be exceptionally good. Bec and so anywhere, we promote any of these changes. So if you want to replace council tax, great. If you want to get rid of stamp duty, great. You want to get rid of TV licenses, awesome. If all these things are good ideas because they are regressive and they don't help our country grow. And it's because of the way that land ownership is treated in this country, and as historically the first law that government ever made was to allow inheritance, you know, to allow their land to be passed on to their kids. So these are the kind of things we're talking about. It's, it's inherent in the system, and we need to change that. That's, that's my thought. Yeah. Uh, can I say something about land value tax? Because mm. I think this really does divide land campaigners mm. right across the world, including in uh, mm. you know, places like Brazil, etc. is the principle. Basically, tax luxuries not essentials land is an essential it should never be taxed secondly uh, you look at places like hong kong what's happened in places like hong kong where there has been or at least parts of hong kong uh, where there's been land value taxes incredible density uh, housing where you're talking about people living in <coughs> like little chicken boxes it's tiny little um, blocks in these massive high density buildings because the uh, pressure is on the landowners to pack people in the other thing is it gives people a pressure to develop. You may have a field. You might want to leave it for pasture for three or four years, but you can't. You've got to pay your land tax. I just think it, it's buying into this whole money system. The money should be there for the luxuries of life, not for the basic essentials. And obviously everyone needs money in some way, but we should be looking after people's basic essentials. And I think that's true freedom. When Stanley said something about uh, he hoped that Britain would be the place where freedom would sit down in triumph, he said in, I think it was one of the, uh, um, uh, the law of freedom, possibly, one of his longer writings. He also talked about the getting rid of money pretty much completely. He said there should be a death penalty for only three things. One for murder, one for paying a lawyer, <laughs> and the other, the death penalty for buying or selling. He thought that basically things should be given and not bought and sold, and that money was buying into a whole kind of almost religious system, which was counter to the natural creation. Can I uh, the, the Green Party financial speaker, uh, Molly Scott Casey, she's an MEP, she uh, really loves land value tax. Know, and she's yeah. really against you know, this kind of idea of the whole um, coming together of, of uh, dense housing. And she says that um, if you were to give the local community some real democracy, in, uh, in what's going on in their local council. So right now you might have a local council who's considering selling off some land to some developers, but you've got a community hub, like I know in Hackney there's a, a garden hub that's, a, that's sorry, in Dalston, um, and, and that's a really important part of the community, and it's, a, you know, but it's owned maybe by the council, they might have to sell it to some developers. Now if the community can turn around and say, you know what, we know this is going to make our local taxes cheaper in some way, our land value taxes. We know, we know that if we got the developers in, we'd have a bit more money coming in, so our taxes inherently would change. But we actually love our community hub, and we don't want them to come in here. So that's, that's the direct way that um, bringing democracy and people together to try and actually decide planning permissions for the local community can totally stop this kind of thing you're talking about, about the dense housing. Um, and, and I think that's just really important to consider here. We're not, a lot of the places where land value tax has been tried that you're mentioning, that, you might, that people might mention, it hasn't been tried by totally getting rid of all the other bad taxes. It's not been, it's not been tried in total isolation with, with really what we're talking about. They've got whole loads of other problems going on and, and we're trying to create a, a situation where we slowly move things over and we try and make a change. The, trouble, the trouble with any tax is who is spending it yeah? and is it being spent on the right things? Is that land value tax just going to go to defence spending? Well, that's what democracy is about, hopefully. I mean, 
Dave, that's I, I knew you'd be prompted, Dave. Go on. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm certainly uh, prompted by uh, <coughs> what uh, Kevin has said about uh, every house paying £14,000 land value tax. One, the whole purpose of the land value tax is it measures the land value. So therefore, a house in Hampstead or Kensington would not pay the same as a house in the Outer Hebrides or a house in a village in uh, Cornwall. And if we were to collect £14,000 for every house in this country, Kevin's already said there's about 26 million houses, that would collect £364 billion. Pounds. How much of the land of this country is actually housing land? It's 2%, according to our government. And uh, the other 98% <coughs> would also contribute an awful lot to places like Oxford Street, uh, the middle of Cambridge, um, sites that are being held out of use in London that pay nothing in taxation today. And of course, with the land value tax bringing more land into productive use, that means more jobs. It means more competition for employees. It means higher wages. It means that we would have fewer people dependent upon the uh, unemployment pay and other social benefits that our taxes are used for. So I would imagine that in a society with a land value tax, we would have much lower government expenditure. Half of our government expenditure today goes either on welfare expenditure or paying uh, dividends to uh, people that have uh, loaned money to the government as regards to government debt. If we had a land value tax, we could have a full, a citizen's land dividend, whereby that would meet your problem about how the government spends the money. If we all shared in the ownership of the land and we all had a land dividend, we ourselves would decide on that element, the Labour land campaign, together with uh, Tony Benn in 1985, put forward a private member's bill um, for the common ownership of land. And we said the income from the land rent should be split three ways. One third to improve public services. One third to reduce the bad taxes that uh, uh, stop production and create unemployment. And one third be redistributed as a land dividend. And the reason we said that in 1985 was because we saw British gas, British airways, profitable, nationalised industries being privatised by the Thatcher government. And nobody saw it. <coughs> Middle class were rushing to the post office to buy their SIG shares. But nobody said, well, actually, we're losing. And what we imagined was by sharing the land dividend, if a Tory government comes along and says, oh, we want to give the land value back to the Duke of Westminster, and people say, well, we're going to lose two or three thousand pounds a year, no thank you, we're not going to vote for that. Do you know where you can look to see such an example? Alaska. In Alaska, they have a permanent oil fund. It's the revenue that arises from the natural resources <coughs> oil in their land. And it's distributed, a proportion of it, is distributed every year to every family. Some years it's as low as $800 a person, other years it's as high as <coughs> $1,000 a person. And it's in statute that that exists. And now, three <coughs> times, politicians have tried to overthrow it because they don't want the people to have the land dividend, uh, the old dividend. They want to decide how well spend it, whether it be on armaments or other things that hopefully none of us in this room can support. And three times, because it had to be agreed at a referendum, three times the people of Alaska, in their wisdom, have thrown it out and said, we'll the dividend. I go around places, uh, internationally and in this country, talking about land and uh, particularly uh, collecting the rental value of land. I'm president of the International Union, for land value tax, and if you want to become a free member, take one of my leaflets and join us. If you want to buy Heather's booklet, Welfare for the Rich, it's only two quid, and you're welcome. Uh, the re original title was going to be Who Subsidises Who? Because it is the poor subsidising the rich. But when I go to schools, I try and explain what economic rent is. 
It's interesting because most uh, economic teachers in schools or colleges or universities don't bother about economic rent. And that shows in the economic advice that is given to our governments by economists like uh, Mr. Balls and others. But I tell them a little story. And uh, it's based on uh, the uh, uh, Robinson Crusoe town. Uh, and with apologies to Daniel Defoe, in my version, Robinson Crusoe swims to the beach and he's met by Man Friday. And Man Friday says, Wow, am I pleased to see you? I've been here four years and I've been on my own. It's going to be nice to have some company. But I must tell you, I've been busy while I've been here during the four years. I set up a parliament. And as I'm the only resident, I elected myself an MP. And as I was the only MP, I elected myself Prime Minister and Charles the Exchequer. And we passed a law that I own all of this island. And we created a police force, and I'm Chief Commissioner of Police. And we created a legal system, and I'm the Chief Judge. And every morning, I go out into my forest, and with my bare hands, I hunt for rabbits. And after four hours, I get one rabbit. I come home, I cook it. It suffices me 24 hours, and the next morning I go out again. You, Robinson Crusoe, you're welcome to stay on my island. But you'll have to go out hunting. I'll give you permission to go hunting in my forest. But you'll have to go out for eight hours and come home with two rabbits. You give me one and you keep one. Well, poor old Robinson Crusoe says this ain't very fair. I'm doing all the work. You're going to lounge on the beach, sunbathing, swimming. So man from he says, well, we have no slaves on the island. Everybody's a free person. And you're at total liberty to reject my terms, but of course, if you do, you go back to your boat. Of course, it's at the bottom of the locker. He stays. Three months every day, eight hours, two rabbits, one each. The end of three months, he thinks he's cooking his rabbit on the fire. He thinks, I can do better than this. I can create capital. Now, capital is person-made wealth being used to produce more wealth. So the next day, out he goes into the forest, and he doesn't do any hunting, he looks for a very sharp flint stone, and after some hours, he finds one. And then he looks for a very straight branch on a tree, and again, after some hours, he finds one, hacks it down with the stone, strips it of the leaves and the twigs, puts a point at one end, some goose feathers at the other end, and he's proudly now got some capital. The next morning, out he goes into the forest with his spear. And after eight hours, he comes home with a number of rabbits. Normally, I ask the kids in the class, how many rabbits has he now got? And they say, perhaps, 19 rabbits. And I say, well, that's great. He gives one to Man Friday, and with a grin from ear to ear, he's got a pile of 18 rabbits in front of him. And Man Friday says, wow, Robinson Crusoe, you're a clever bloke. I've been here four years and three months. I never thought of creating capital. But I've got some bad news for you. Your rent has just gone up to 18 rand. <laughs> and, that, and that is the society we live in. And if you want to raise taxes, do you raise taxes on the one rabbit that's left with Robinson Crusoe or on the 18 rabbits that Man Friday enjoys? <laughs>
a housing crisis and a food crisis at the moment in this country, I presume that's why everyone's here. And one of the main reasons for that is the way we use land. The fact we don't have a decent democratic system around land, use of land, whether it's ownership or access or whatever. And I think it's a real shame that there's not a more vibrant and widespread campaign around land reform. Um, possibly listening to the evening, maybe one of the reasons is, is because um, some people who know a lot about this stuff get immediately stuck into a specific area of debate and that can crowd out a lot of the other issues and solutions that will come if we talk about land, so around housing, around subsidy, around who gets access to what, um, around planning. I'm personally involved in planning reform and planning applications and how that can use land. So I think I would just urge people to look at a, um, a bigger picture around being involved in campaigning around food sovereignty. There's a food sovereignty gathering at the end of this year in October and that's going to look at a lot of agricultural uh, problems and, and solutions that we could have around access to land. Um, and in London, as being there mentioned, there's a radical housing network, which is a lot of local campaigns and people who are fighting all of the different seizures and privatisation of social housing and different estates. I mean, that's just a, that's just a London thing, but it's obviously particular here. There's, there's lots going on, and I think what we need is a lot more coming together from all the people who could benefit from the change use of land. Um, and I hope that um, maybe through the Landworkers Alliance, we can start to do that, to start to create a bit more of a, a wider campaigning platform that um, a lot of this wider stuff can be dealt with. And so look up for that Food Sovereignty Gathering, and the Food Sovereignty as a website as well. And uh, if you're near to one of these local housing issues in London, get involved in that, because that's really, that's the cusp of it at the moment about our, our resources being privatised or they for social use. So thanks very much. Sorry. Thinking about the land, which is not about uh, you know, financial value, it's very much enshrining in law what the traditional types of landholders are cropping. So don't go to Scotland without going, spending a bit of time on the crop and getting to know the way they do things, because I think that's our community memory, which in England has been completely forgotten. Uh, the other place to go if you're up in Nottinghamshire is Laxton, uh, which is near Newark, which is it's owned by the Crown Estate. It's the only unenclosed village left. And it does feel rather different to other villages. In other words, there, isn't, there aren't sort of public footpaths. There are whole areas of the village you just walk where you want in the field. So they've still got, essentially, the old traditional open field system, which was like giant bottles that everyone in the village used to share. So Maxton is a fascinating place to spend an afternoon or a day. It means stay at the local hotel. Uh, so just, you know, this, this whole way of doing things in the traditional manner is still just about there in some uh, ways. The other thing I think in the modern world, I, f I feel that the left has definitely got to grips with this idea that in a way, in some weird way, if you care about our freedom, the benefits system is a kind of compensation for stolen land. Yeah. And it takes a little bit of thinking about, but I think you know there is definitely a, a, an element there where everybody deserves the right to water and a bit of money for rent and food. And funnily enough, I, when I was living in Oxford, I went through some old dictionary uh, because I, I was trying to get to the bottom of the word dull. Now this is a word we all use all the time, and I went back through the dictionaries, and now you had to go back to. Books one of the first editions of Encyclopedia Britannica where I came across, because it looks to me as if the actual etymology of the word has been covered up over the years, you know. But, but anyway, what it said was, the word dole means a part or portion, most commonly of a meadow, where several people have shares. So the dole was a right that people had who were homeless or had nowhere to live, outdoors even, where they could keep their sheep, keep their animals and stay. Uh, in the village, and there was always an understanding, and it wasn't the Criminal Justice Act where we got rid of the right for gypsies to stay by the side of the road, and the police would then come and tap on the van. Look, for me, a civilised nation has got to allow travelling people, and that's one of the almost unspoken things today we've heard over the last 30, 40 years, slowly but surely, travellers and gypsies have been harassed 
and harangue off of our roads. You very, very rarely see them anymore. The discussions and the debates, as you said, the, the various groups, the various discussions. Uh, I spoke at the uh, Diggins Festival up in Wigan last year, the group where um, Joe and Stanley hails from, and they have a lot of the music, what's going to get with this, and then seminars about land and other issues. It's quite remarkable, I've been this all day. We're having campaigns kicking off all over of occupation as well, with the kind of paying the rents, we sort of both in terms of housing benefit, also the tax subsidies, we'll almost probably see more tax benefits to write to buyers tomorrow as well, and also the EU subsidies that come back up. So I think the debate is beginning to happen. There isn't one particularly, um, there isn't one direct route to solving this, but it is about how people have to challenge the whole concept of the ownership and the, the monopoly and cartel ownerships of land. That's actually having a discussion now.